when the twins came back home from picking up their food, it was reported that one of the twins, I believe, Jeanette, told your mother that there was a white van following them. But this goes back to the twins' father, John. Do you all think that it's a possibility that he could have been involved, either either involved in the twins' disappearance directly or that he may have knew more than what he was what he was telling. We talked into him and asked him, did he know what happened to my sister and where where they were? And the first thing that came out of his mouth was they was dead. This is the first case of missing twins that are still missing today. They should be America's twins, and nobody knows about them. Police didn't do nothing. Anybody that was our color was runaway. The twin's father hung out with people who committed murders. An apparent serial killer who was operating in their neighborhood. What if I told you that I know where you could find them? Good afternoon, y'all. I'm just waiting on some more people to join the live. We are going to be having a conversation with the sister of the Millbrook twins who unfortunately they are still missing. They have been missing since about 1990. They are still missing today. And it's just been a, a lot of injustices have been done in this case. I'm seeing that their sister is actually in the live now too. So I'm gonna have her call in in just a second. You with us? Yes, can you hear me? I can, hi beautiful. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to talk to me. I appreciate it. No problem. Y'all, please make sure y'all share this live. Um, for the people that's just joining the live, can you like introduce yourself? And I know I said who you were earlier, but for those people that, you know, just came in. Um, I'm Shante Sturgis. My sisters are Jeanette and Danny at Millbrook. I'm their baby sister. Well, their younger sister. Okay. It's, it's like 10 of us, but... Um, my older sister, she passed away in 2018, and the rest of them are under me. Okay. Okay. So the twins were older than you. Yes. Okay. So I'm going I'm to go ahead and start. I know we still have a lot of people coming into the live, even as I'm talking. And y'all got to forgive me because you may see me looking down at my notes from time to time. I had to write some stuff down. But just to start off, what kind of girls were the twins like i know that you know people may have watched the documentary a lot of people may be familiar with their case some people may not be familiar with their case but for those people like me who never got the opportunity to meet your sisters what was it like living in a household with them like what were some things that they like to do mostly watch tv and play outside i mean we really didn't even do too much or nothing. Basically, we used to just, if we went anywhere, like to the skating ring or places like that, to the movies, it's always with my mom. I mean, they was good girls. They didn't get in no kind of trouble or nothing. So I, I just couldn't tell you what happened to them. I, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you. The liquor, I, I just can't think of nothing that would say they ran away from home. And, or they would have had a reason to because I know a lot of people wondering like how two people just up and just walk off but it wasn't like that they was like they loved school my sister Jeanette she loved it cats she had a cat named Jennifer um, she I mean both of them they was good girls they didn't get in no trouble like um, Danette they probably got in maybe two fights since they was in school that I know of. And the only reason why they got in the fight is because um, some girls was picking on Jeanette and then it was basically defending her. But other than that, they didn't get into trouble with the police, no nothing. So why they called my sisters unruly runaways, I have no idea. Wow. Now I know that the twins mm -hmm. went missing, I believe March 18th, 1990. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm looking That's at my true. notes. Okay. And I know that you all went to church that morning. 
according to reports. I know that you all, or at some point after church, the girls went and got lunch and right. they came back home. Now, when the twins came back home from picking up their food, it was reported that one of the twins, I believe, Jeanette, told your mother that there was a white van following them. That's um, true. Can you elaborate on if the twins, did they say anything about who the driver of that van could have been or if the driver of that van had said anything to them? No, they just told my mom. She just came in there and she was like, uh, Mama, I think it was a man in a white van following us, but she didn't specifically say that who the person was, what color they was, nothing like that. She just said she think they was following them. But my mom went to the door and looked out. She didn't see no van. So we never could, you know, find out if the van was actually following them or not. Because it could have been just going the same way they was going. I mean, I'm not sure of what made her think that the van was following them. It could have been, but we, we want to know, you know. I just wanted to ask about that because I thought that you know, I don't really believe in coincidences, but like you said, we don't know if it's connected or not. But I remember reading that in a report, and that was just kind of weird to me because I'm like, that was the same day that they went missing. So are the two connected? I know you don't know. I don't know. We don't know. And, you know, we may never know. Now, I know that the twins left out from their home. I know, like I said, they went to get lunch, and they left the home again at some point. I believe around three. And again, I'm reading from my notes, so please co correct it was me. If around, I'm wrong. It was like around between two thirty to three o'clock okay. when they left. They left to go to my goddad house because while we was eating lunch, they was talking about going to school that next day, which would have been that Monday because they went missing on the Sunday. Okay, so when my mom told them to call my goddad. They asked him, could he get and loan them $20 until, you know, she gets some money to pay him back or whatever. He told them, yeah. So they told my mom that they was going to pick the money up, which they did get make it to his house. We did get that confirmed. But after they left his house, that's when stuff went wrong because they were supposed to return back home after they left his house, but instead they went to my older sister's house. Before they went to her house, they went to a cousin of my house, asking them to walk home with them. So I'm going to assume the reason why they was doing that is because something, either somebody was following them or they didn't feel comfortable enough walking back home by themselves. Okay. But after that, um, you know, it started getting dark and later and later and later and my mom just started calling around asking different people have they seen them and my older sister was one of them and when she called her she told my mom that they did come by her house but my older sister had just had her first son so she wasn't up to walking home with them so I'm going to assume, you know they left and when they left, it, she told my mom that they left walking like they was going towards the pump and shop store. The pump and shop store is like maybe, uh, I want to say a, a block, a, like a half a block from where my sister lived. It was right around the corner from where she lived. So when me and my mom she got set out to go look for them because they still had made it back home after all the phone calls she had made looking for them. We made it down to the pump and shop store and the lady that worked in the store, we knew her because as little kids, we stayed right by that store. And the lady that worked there, her name was Gloria. My mom and I went in there and asked her, had she seen them? Did they come in the store? And she was like, yeah. She said they came in like, you know, like it was a normal day. She told them what they brought. And after that, she said she had to ring up another customer. She looked up and they was gone. And just like that, they just vanished in the thing in there. Nobody seen them no more. So let me ask you this. Um, what was what was the initial response? Because I know that at some point, like you said, you and your mother searched for the twins on foot when they had not come home that night or that evening. And I know at some point, I'm not sure who, but at some point someone called 911. What was the initial post? My mom. Okay. My yeah, my mom reported the same night. My mom reported them missing. But when the uh, police, you know, 
when she talked to them, they told her that she had to wait 24 hours before she could report them missed. So she had to wait till the next day, but she stayed up all night praying that they was going to come back through the door, but they never did. So the next day she did call the police. They sent the police officer out. The police officer came out there and got all the information incorrect from my god dad's um, house the street that he lived on they never did go check my sister them house because we didn't find out about my sister them going to my sister's um house and leaving there until you know we knew that they came there but we didn't actually know exactly what they went there for we didn't find that out until like uh 2017 Oh, wow. Because my sister never told my mom that they asked her to walk home with them. She just told them that they had came by. So, after she reported them missing, they got their birthdays wrong. That's one. They got their name spelled wrong. The middle name. The last name, which is, their last name is Mira Brooke. Not with the S, but they had an S on the, the end of their names. And then they had their birthdays wrong. Wow. So the police just, the police basically just dropped the ball. Right. All the way from, from the, the jump. Yeah. yeah. From the okay. start. And I know that at one point, I remember reading somewhere and seeing, because I did watch the documentary on Oxygen, and I actually watched it a couple of times. I know that at one point, it was said that law enforcement lost the police reports early on in the case. Right. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go back before that, right? That happened when the original investigator came out, it went until that next week, which would have been like the end of March, mm -hmm. like close to, I want to say he probably came out there that, that next Monday after they went missing which he should have came out there that same week because my mom kept calling them, telling them that they still hadn't came home. Okay. Whatever report he supposedly had, they told us, this is after the case was closed, that they told us that um, my sister and them case for file had got lost in the flood because it was flooding down here and where the police station sits at, it was like heavily damaged. I guess the roof or something was something was going on with their roof or whatever. And it was flooded, but that still don't change the fact that they talking about the case file was lost, but then years later, the same case file that said it was lost, the investigator said he gave it to a juvenile probation officer. Did he did he say why? Why he I mean why would he He said he gave it to the juvenile probation officer because my sister then was unruly runaways. Wow. Even though he had no evidence of this. No evidence. They have never ran away from home. They have never got into trouble with the police. Nothing. But that's what he said. But unknown to him, the same now my older sister, she was getting into trouble like running away from home stuff like to that nature because she wanted to be with her boyfriend which is her kid's father um she did do that but then that and then that they want them type of girls you know i, I could just picture Jeanette right now the only thing she like to do is sit in front of the tv she, she didn't go anywhere neither one of them and if they did we was all together you get what i'm saying so I just can't think of no reason why he would label them as runaways. The only thing I could think of is because of the neighborhood that we stayed in, which we stayed in a project, and my sister name was Black Girl. Right. Because I remember around that same time, one of my classmates, which he was a white guy, they was looking for him, i say probably like a year or so after my sister name had went missing. Anyway, um, they was looking for him but they did a search for him. They only put my sister name on the news one time the week that they went missing. And the next time they put my sister name on the news was like probably the end of 1990. They never did like get no kind of media attention. 
And the only reason why they put them back on the news that second time is because the people that we went to church with, my, uh, the church members, told my mom to go back down there. They went down there with my mom to the police station to get them to do something, you know what I'm saying? Because they still had came home. And it's like, what, eight months or so later? Wow. And they still hadn't did nothing. So let me ask you this. I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit, but I'm kind of like fast forwarding because I know that they went missing in 1990. I know that sometime in 1991, the investigator, I don't know if he was the lead investigator, but it seems like yes. he was, Mr. Shep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mr. Shep, I know that he mm -hmm. uh, visited you all's family in 1991 and he shared some news with y'all that was really disturbing. Can you elaborate on that visit? Okay, so when he came back around, he came back around after they had turned 17, their birthday, April the 2nd. He came to my mom's house April the 8th and told my mom that he was closing the case out because my sister and them had been found. He never told her where, never gave her no address, no none of that. So then he turned around and said, had he found them, that he couldn't make them come back home because they were 17 years old. So case was closed. 1991, case closed. Nobody looking for him. No nothing. Okay, the National Missing and Explored Children, they was involved because they was the ones that sent the flyers out. We put flyers up all around the neighborhood. Okay, so push forward, 1993, the same investigator called National Miss Missing and Explored Children and told them to take my sister and them out of the database mm -hmm. because my sister and them shouldn't have never been in the database. The same man, Mr. Shep. Yes. And how we found that out when everybody else found out in the documentary. Mm -hmm. But for years, I kept telling my mama it had to be him. But they wouldn't ever tell us who it was. The only thing we know is the case was closed. 93, somebody calls up there and tell them to take them out of the database. So for 23 years, nobody never looked for my sister there. No media attention, no nothing. Nobody. Anybody we reached out to when um, help looked for them because they said the police in our hometown had to be the one that got them involved. And it's from the FBI, the GBI. My mom even called John Walsh. You know, called his show. They told her that they had nothing they, they could do to help her. I, myself, reached out to the Oprah Winfrey show, Montel Williams, uh, Gerardo, all these different talk show hosts that was out back then to get somebody to help. But when nobody, either they weren't responding or they didn't get the letters or something, but nobody would never look for them. Nobody would never help. But the same juvenile probation officer that he said he gave my sister them case file to he was involved with my mom already about my sister so when he got the file he told my mom that he was going to help her look for my sister them because he couldn't understand why two girls just up and disappear and nobody hear from them again now the investigator tells um the oxygen people and it's a uh, podcast called the foul line Mm -hmm. They're actually the reason why my sister and them actually got national attention. It's because of them. Not because of the police department. Not because, even though I had a Facebook page uh, for them, nobody knew. Basically, you know, better select few people. But for 20 something years, nobody knew. And I guess these people, they, they, uh, one of them was a school teacher at a college in Atlanta. And her students did a um what you want to call it i guess you want to say some kind of um uh, project and my sister them was the, the project they was doing a story on my sister name or whatever and they contacted me and when they contacted me you know, I got to talking to them. They got to doing their own investigation. I told them, I know they this about my age, you know what I'm saying? But I said, I wish y'all was around back then because probably we'll know now. Because for a long time, we thought didn't nobody care, you know. And, and it's like, didn't nobody care because when nobody helped. And, and even though we reached out to them, telling them it's not true that 
my sister then was found. They still missing. But it's like people just, to me, you would think it would be people in your hometown that would help you out, but nothing. And rally behind you. Yeah, right. Now, I know at one mm -hmm. point um, I read something about somebody came forward. This was before the case was closed, I'm assuming. Somebody came forward with some kind of tip saying that they had saw the girls leaving but i also know that the main investigator who you were just speaking of mr ship admitted later on that he never even verified the tip and so you just you know you get this tip and then you run off and the you tip was supposed to be the principal of the school okay say the principal of the school told him that he saw my sister and them standing on the corner of lane walker and 12th street and that my sister and him seen him and they took off running when he called their name. That don't even make sense. That doesn't even sound right. At all. And, and so you can't verify none of it. And just like you can't even verify if the um, juvenile probation officer had their case filed because uh, after he had told my mom that he was going to help her look for my sister now, lo and behold, he ended up passing away. So we never did get that help from him. And there was another guy that worked in law enforcement. He told my mom also that he was going to help her find out what happened to my sister now. He then passed away after. Wow. But he, um, the ship, that's the ship told the oxygen um, crew and he told um, the Far Line podcast people that my sister now supposedly told the juvenile probation officer. Um, that they was they, the juvenile probation officer supposed to know where my sister then was at the whole time and said that they told him that they was trying to go get to Texas, but they must be 15 years old with no money, no job. $20 wasn't going to get where they actually had $24. Because so my god, dad, he always gave us money, you know. We was little kids excited to get that little two dollars or a dollar fifty cent because back then, you know, stuff was really cheap back then, so. <laughs> They got me a little twenty four dollars, and they weren't finna go far. They couldn't go. Where, where was they gonna go? Exactly. With twenty four dollars. With twenty four dollars, they they yeah. So let me ask you this, and you gotta excuse me because I'm reading from my notes again. Okay. I know that the, the twins' father, John. Mm -hmm. I know that you know. I read some things about him, and I'm not sure if you're comfortable answering this question. And of course, if I, I meant to say this earlier in the beginning, but if I ask you anything that you don't feel comfortable with, please charge it to my head and not my heart. And you definitely do not have to answer anything that you don't feel comfortable answering. Um, but I read some things about him that were kind of disturbing and interesting at the same time. What was John, again, for the people that's just joining the twins' father, what was his initial response when the twins first went missing? He told my mom not to go look for them because they was probably out there with some man. Wow. Leave them girls out there. That's what he said. So he never did want to go look for them. He never did try to help no nothing. Wow. And then sometime after that, he got involved with these guys. And he ended up going to prison because he helped these guys kill. Uh, well, he didn't kill them, but the guys killed them. And he helped them, you know, got rid of the body. You talking about Reggie and Ernest. Um, We're going to get to that. <laughs> We're going to get to that, too, because I've been digging deep. Like, when I, you know, when I do these interviews, I like to know, you know, the background on the case. So I've been doing like a deep dive down this hole. It's, it's almost like a rabbit hole because it's so, and I, I know it has to be worse for you you know, as the family, but it's so, it's just so frustrating because you just want to know where are they, what happened? Like, what yeah. happened? And we know that somebody knows something. Yeah. Somebody got to know something. Let me ask you this, and you don't have to answer this question, but this goes back to the twins' father, John. Do you all think that it's a possibility that he could have been involved Either, either involved in the twins' disappearance directly, or that he may have knew more than what he was what he was telling. I mean, in some way, I do because why wouldn't you want to look for your kids? Exactly. What reason? Even if they was out there with some means, if you say they was, why wouldn't you want to? 
go out there and look for them and bring them home. You don't know what's going on out there in the world. They could have been out there getting hurt, anything, and you talking about leaving them out there. That don't make sense to me. And then it's, it's something else that I want to say that he said, and this is like maybe a year or so before he went to the nursing home because for a long time we hadn't seen him. I haven't anyway, you know. So it's like we went up there to go see him one day. Um, it's crazy. This is the craziest thing. Okay, my my son, my oldest child, and Ernest is one of the guys that he helped hide the body. Mm -hmm. His daughter and my son, ironically, meets in high school, get married, have four kids. Oh, wow. Okay. So, during this time when the fall line got involved, I had no idea that this was the same guy. When they mentioned the name and said Ernest Vaughn, I remember talking to my daughter-in-law about her dad one day. And then she told me what her dad's name was. And when she said Ernest, when they told me Ernest Vaughn, I was like, oh, what? You know, she said her dad's name was Ernest Vaughn, too. So I called on the phone. And ironically, this is the same guy. The same guy that was involved. But he said he was 12 years old at the time when all this took place or whatever. But I don't know. But it's it just crazy to me that his mother... Not not Ernest Vaughn, but the Reggie Cummins dude. Dabber, he, is that one? Yes. That's Ernest. I mean, um, that's uh what's his name? Um Reggie. Reggie Cummins. That's his mother. Mm -hmm. She's the one that's supposed to be my sister's name's caregiver. My that sister name dad's caregiver. Some kind of way she wasn't doing what she's supposed to do, she ends up in jail. My sister and them dad ends up in the hospital. We see it on the news, goes up there to talk to him. We we got him now. You know, we can finally talk to him because he would run from the police. He wouldn't talk to the police at all. He told the, uh, my older sister because the twins and my older sister has the same dad. Okay. He told him, her to tell the police if they came to her, asking her questions about him to tell them that he was dead. Wow. So that's how much involvement he didn't want to be. Hmm. Helping locate his kids. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, um, the lady, I mean, he ends up in the hospital. We goes up there to see him. So, we talked to him and asked him, did he know what happened to my sister and where, where they were? And the first thing that came out of his mouth was they was dead. But then again, when they start questioning him, asking him, do he know where they was buried at? Was they buried in the city? Was they buried in the country? You know, where can he tell them they bought the books? And that's when he starts switching stuff up and saying, well, I don't know what happened to him woman. Stuff like that. You know, they saying that because he had dementia, that he probably was just talking and they couldn't really verify. It. But these are not law enforcement people that's talking to him. Law enforcement never did question him. They could have questioned him years before uh -huh. before he got dementia, before he even, you know, lost his mind or whatever the case may be. But they never did. So all the people that law enforcement should have been questioning, they never did question. Wow. Yeah. And the thing about dementia, we know, you know, because my grandmother had dementia, we know that sometimes they do have moments of clarity. Right. You know, so that's what I'm saying. So we don't, we'll never know uh -huh. if what he was saying was truthful or not. Because he he gone now. He died what twenty twenty. Wow. Yeah, he died in like uh twenty twenty two thousand twenty. And the police yeah. never interviewed him. Nope. Oh Lord, mercy. Now I know that. In 2004, according to what I read, you started like a, a campaign 
to, you know, get some attention on this, on your missing sisters. And eventually your efforts were successful because I believe the case was reopened in 2013. Right. Can you tell us about the efforts that you made as far as trying to get the, the case reopened from 2004. I mean, I basically just kept calling, you know, that's all I could do. Because at the time when they went missing, I was 12 years old, you know, and years had done passed by before I became of age, you know. But still in my mind, in the back of my mind, I always knew my sister then was out there. I had to endure watching my mom, you know, struggle trying to get people to help her. And one day she just said that she wasn't finna call back down there to the police department no more because they weren't doing nothing to help her. I was like, well, don't worry about it, Ma. I got you. I do. So from that point on, I kept calling and kept calling and kept calling. I was pretty much getting run to run around like she was. Them telling us ain't nothing they could do to help us. And then sometimes call down there and I'd be like, I'm calling down here to talk to y'all about my sister and them. Oh, they say, oh, you talk about the Mirror Work Twins? I'd be like, yes. And then they'll be like, well, you need to call um to the defects office because the Department of Family and Trinity Service because your sister and them was removed out of the home. And I'm like... No, my sister then was not removed out of the home. They telling me, yes, they were. You need to talk to your mom. I said, no, I'm talking to y'all because I know for a fact they wasn't. I'm one of the, my mom's kids. I was living in the home also. So if y'all, if they felt something was going on with my sister then, you know, being harmed or whatever, why they just going to take them and not the rest of us? They're going to take every last one of the kids instead of leaving them in harm's way. Okay. After they told me that, you know, I did what they said. I called defects. They tell me they can't give me no information, but if it's been that amount of years, they probably been adopted out. I said, but they was 15 years old at the time. They told me to call some adoption agency, whatever the adoption agency was. I can't remember the name, but it was in Atlanta. I called down there. They told me they couldn't give me no information over the phone, but they'd send me a package in the mail for me to fill it out, send it back to them, and then they would be able to help because I guess I had to identify that I was really related to them or whatever. So um, they sent the paperwork, but I never sent it back because I already knew down in my heart that it wasn't true. You know, they wasn't adopted. They weren't taken from my mom. My mom's kids never been taken from her. They was always in the home with her. Everybody was always, we was a close-knit family because there wasn't nobody down here in Augusta, Georgia with us, but us, me, my mom, and my sister. And now we have a brother, which he's 31 years old now. But at the time, he wasn't born, you know, when my sister knew. Yeah, so they got a brother out here that they don't even know nothing about. Wow. Yeah. Now, I know that in 2013, the case, like I said earlier, was reopened after it hadn't been closed because of this idiot investigator ship. Yeah, they opened it back up after I kept calling and kept calling and we was getting ready to have um, the election. It was election time. And the sheriff that was in office um, from the beginning, when they first went missing, his name was Ronnie Scrim. He was a white guy. Okay. So... You know me, in my mind, I'm thinking like, hey, we get a new sheriff, going to be the new black sheriff. Let me call down here. I don't see him on TV saying how he wanted to help his community and all this stuff. Okay. So I called down there. I left a message. He didn't call me back, but the guy that was running against him was the one that called me back. His name was Scott Peebles. He called me back. He told me that um he had looked into my sister in case. Mind you, they said the case file was lost. Right, exactly. But he said, I looked into it, and he said, I see that the case was closed off of hearsay, and he said, I just don't like that. So I'm going to open the case back up. This was in September of 2013 when my sister named case finally got opened back up. Okay. Now, I know at some point after the case was reopened, Mm -hmm. um, a DNA test was conducted and I believe they got DNA from my mom and my older sister okay they didn't and get DNA from the dad because the dad refused you know they couldn't find him anyway and so there was mm -hmm. nothing there were no hits in the database when they ran the DNA through the national database it didn't come back 
as a match to anybody. Nobody. Let me ask you this. When the case was reopened in 2013, other than the DNA testing, did law enforcement make any other efforts to locate the twins? And if if they did, what did they do? No. Wow. No, they just kept putting different investigators over. They had one investigator when they first opened it back up. She was over the case, but after she started looking into it and asking questions and asking us people names that we have never heard of, some of them, some of them I have, you know. But um, basically, she was over the case. I want to say probably maybe three months. Oh wow! And now, out of this whole time, nobody never called us from the police department. No contacts, no nothing. They never reached out to us. She was the only one that did reach out to us when she did get the case. She stayed on. She came to the house, uh, to my mom's house, you know. She called me. And just one particular day, I up and called because I hadn't heard from her. And when I called down there, she was no longer working for them. Wow. And, and it was after the case had gotten reopened. After the case had gotten reopened. So I, I want to say probably like 2014, something, whatever, up in there, um, she was off the case. She wasn't even on it no more. Wow. Now, if I hadn't called down there to try to locate her because I hadn't heard from her in a while, I wouldn't have never knew that. You know what I'm saying? So I asked them, well, who's going to be over the case for um, the Millbrook twins? And they was like, um, they had a missing, I guess, um, they they want to sign a Pacific person to it, but they just gave it to an investigator. That investigator told me, um, I think his name was Investigator Sylvester, I'm, I'm not sure. But anyway, he told me that he was going to try to look into the case. Okay, next thing we know, 2017 comes, they put another investigator over it. So all that time, listen to me, all that time had them passed by that we never talked to nobody until 2017 when the Fall Nine podcast got involved and they started calling down there, asking questions and stuff, trying to reach out. This is when we find out it was a serial killer around here mm -hmm. at the time when my sister Nan went missing. He, one of his victims was kidnapped from the area where my sister Nan went missing from. Mm -hmm. But well, that was my did. next question. That was my next question was about him. I think Joseph Patrick Washington Correct. was his name. That yes. was my next question. So since we since we mentioned him, since we on him, he did I did hear them say in the documentary that he had abducted a woman in the parking lot of the same gas station where your sisters had went missing from. Right. So, do you know if law enforcement ever looked into him no. as a suspect? No. Wow. No, they said that because of their age. But, as you can see, even back then, girls developed. Huh. And they didn't look their age. So, he could have thought that they was probably 20-something years old or something like that. I mean, they never know. You get what I'm saying? So, they fit the profile of the women that he would abduct and kidnap. He would uh, kidnap them. He would shoot them first and then rape them and leave them out there in the landfill where he worked at. He used to work at this company called the Brickyard Pond. And it was two different um, places. Okay, they had one over here off of, um, in the area where we used to stay. And then they had another one over there off Gordon Highway by Molly Pond Road. Either way it go, he would transport these women from different spots. And he would all take all of them over there where, like, it was a place called Lovers Lane. Lovers Lane was a, a known place where people would kill people and leave their bodies out there. Wow. But we didn't never know. It cause like I said, I was 12. So... We weren't, you know, we weren't paying none of that stuff no attention. I really ain't start paying none of this stuff no attention until this happened to my sisters. But, but it's just, it's just so. And when I found out about him and y'all, for the people that's just joining, we're talking about the guy Joseph Patrick Washington. When I found out in the documentary that there had been a serial killer, like the lady said, operating in the same vicinity 
that the twins went missing in and he had not only that but he had we know he had already kidnapped a woman from the same gas station that the twins were last seen at and to, to know that law enforcement never followed up and never yeah, looked they at him they really my sister them never got an investigation they never did they didn't ever investigate it just was completely I want to say the word, but I'm just, it was messed up. Yeah. They were late the runaways very early in the case. We saw yeah, it yes. very early. Yeah, I, I just don't understand. I can't think of no other reason why he would do that. Unless, unless he was involved. That's what I think. Because first you tell us, that this probation officer had they filed that he said that they was trying to get to Texas. Then again you turn around and said that they had been found. Which is it, you know? What if he did you know what I'm saying? I always had this in the back of my mind since this happened. Just for instance, what if they did run away? What if he found them? What if he did something with them? You get what I'm saying? I don't seen plenty of stories on TV with law enforcement being involved in people, kidnappings, murders. You know, they ain't always innocent. So who knows what happened? It just might have funny that he tried to stop everything that we was trying to do to get somebody to help us look for them. And I think for clarity, y'all, she um Chante is speaking about Jim Ship, who was the lead investigator when the twins first went missing. Right. Um, that's I, I looked at that too though. It seemed like every every step forward that y'all would take, he would just okay. snatch yeah. and pull y'all back. Exactly. Even when he got the twins name taken off of out of the database for the national missing and exploited children out of that database. You know, right. he was just he was just doing a lot. He was just dropping the ball left and right. Yeah. yeah. And it's like was, was it just was he really that yeah. incompetent or, or or was he trying to cover something? I think I think so. He was. I think he probably either he was covering something up. Or he was just that incompetent because he also told them the, he don't even know why they put him over missing people cases. Oh, he said he wish they had never did it because um he couldn't go home. He didn't have kids. That's what he said. I didn't. Ha he didn't have kids, and um he think that's the reason why they put him over missing people because he didn't have kids that he could go home to kill. What? Now, I know earlier we talked a little bit about the twins' father, John, mm -hmm. and I know that at one point, John was arrested in connection to a murder, and I know you talked about that a little bit before, and mm -hmm. when he was arrested, he was arrested with his two friends, um, Ernest Vaughn and Reggie Cummings. I think I'm yeah, it was actually right? more than that, though, but yeah, them was the only two that wrote that. Ernest Vaughn and Reggie Cummings was the only two that was full. Of them plus my sister and them dad so five total but them was the only two that responded back to the letters right. I, I, know know that, the was. I know that in the letter and and i just i just want to make sure the audience can follow along so the i guess the producers of the fall line or the host of the fall mm -hmm. line podcast they had um reached out to ernest and reggie and right. were, you know, corresponding with them. I believe Ernest and Reggie were both incarcerated at that time, but they had yes. reached out to them. Mm -hmm. And one of them, I think it was Ernest, wrote back and said, and I, I don't know if you want to get more into what he said. Yeah, he said that um, he could give them information if they could help him get out of prison, basically, because he got a life sentence for what he did, but um, that's what he said. If they uh, help him get out, uh, help him get paroled out, rather, um, that they would give them the information that they needed. Yeah. He basically, didn't he basically admit in the letter that he knew where the girls said, were? Yeah, he said he knew what happened to them, but they had to help him first. So, that same year that the letter came, Ernest was supposed to get um go up for a parole date that December. Okay. That December came, his parole got denied again. Okay. Even after the parole was denied, he still was saying that he wanted to talk and tell what happened. And that's when 
you see in the uh, documentary what he was saying. He was the one that was on the phone. Uh -huh. And you see what he was saying about um, that they had picked him up from the gas station, took him down to the dad house. They supposed to be in that, some kind of part at the dad house. They was down there drinking and smoking weed and all this stuff, which that right there just threw me for a loop because my sister and them wasn't even them type of girl. They ain't drank, they ain't smoked, none of that stuff. You know what I'm saying? And when you say the dad, yeah. are you talking about John for clarity, the twins' father? Yeah. Okay. John Pembroke, yeah. That's their dad. That's who house the party was supposed to be at. And he said that um when they got down to the party, that um everybody was smoking, drinking heavily and stuff like that, and that um John was on crack and they gave John some crack. He supposed to be in, um was smoking crack while the party was going on, I guess, and one of the guys was trying to come on to one of the twins. I'm not sure which one. One of the twins supposed to be in, got forced in the room. Um, the other twin tried to help, and that's when one of the guys supposed to be hit him and knocked her into a table, and she hit her head and started bleeding out. And he said the reason why he believes something happened to the other twin is because he never seen her again no more after that night. Say they made everybody leave the party after that, all that had happened. And this is the person that said this again was Ernest. Ernest, uh, yeah. Ernest who was who was friends with the Millbrooks twin father. Yeah. Right. Friends with John the father. Okay. Right. So let me ask you this. Do you know when when Ernest made all these statements? Do you know because from my research, it's unclear what did the police even do with this information? Did they follow up on this? Did they? They, they supposedly went to the prison where Ernest will, um, well, not Ernest, but where Reggie Cummings was. And another one of the guys who they didn't say, his name was supposed to be Little Cheese. And they said that, um, Everybody would talk to them, but Reggie say Reggie had told them that they weren't finna talk to him about not them about nothing. That he wanted his lawyer first, so they left it alone because they said after further investigating, they found out that the story that Ernest gave about them supposed to be had the party and that my sister was supposed to be killed at my dad um, sister and them dad's house. That they found the story to be untrue. They said he was just saying all that stuff to get attention to for somebody to help get him out of prison because he was up for parole. Did they right. did they go into like why like did they have any evidence to show that he was lying or no? And then after they went to the prison to talk to him. They they went up talk to him, but they also talked to the other guys like I've said. So um they ended up talking to him, calling my mom. Okay, me and my mom went down there to the police station. They wanted to do, you know, ask us questions about basically the, the whole thing from beginning to end when they had us down there about the story, about where they went that day and what they had on and all that stuff there. Now, this is when they're supposed to be trying to do the investigation. They're supposed to be trying to help now. So we get down there. They talk to us. They saying that they was going to do everything they could to help and try to locate my sister now. Okay. About a week or so after them going to see the guys that's in prison, they uh, called my mom. They didn't call me. They called my mom and told my mom that it was no longer investigating what Ernest said because they found it not to be credible. They said his story was not truthful. And then my mom called me, you know, she was upset, crying, saying that, that now they're saying they ain't finna help. I knew it, this was going to be a big mistake about the documentary, you know. And I was like, no, nah, mom. I said, let me call down here and find out what's going on. So I get on the phone, I call. I end up talking to the guy who called my mom, and this is exactly what he said. He told me on the phone, and he also told the oxygen people the same thing that I'm going to tell you. He said that the story that Ernest gave was truthful, but it wasn't my sister now that it happened to. It was two other girls. But there's no two other girls that's mentioned down here in Augusta, Georgia. Not twins. 
something, yeah. And this is an investigator. This is law enforcement that told y'all that. That's great. So you had some people in law, because even I'm confused at this point. You had some people in law enforcement telling y'all that Ernest is lying. Don't pay what he's saying. No mind. He's just trying to get out on parole. And then you had this other investigator saying, no, he's not lying. The story is actually true, but it's not right. about the Millbrook twins. Your sister. Exactly. Yes. And I asked him, I said, well, if it's true and you saying it happened to two other girls, who are the two other girls? I said, because I, you know, I wanted to look it up. I wanted to see what other two girls that's been missing all this time, you know. And he told me that they couldn't give me that information because they were still investigating it. Wow. So what has, what has become of that? Like, have you tried to reach out to Ernest yourself or has your mom been anyone else? I tried to myself and he did not respond back to me. Oh wow! But I got here, like I said, his my ex daughter in law because my son is her divorce now. But my ex daughter in law, I uh, reached out to her to get her to reach out to him because that's her dad. And when she tried to call him to talk to him about it, he basically c cut her off because the oxygen people are supposed to be gave some money or something. I don't know. You know, they supposed to pay him some money or something to talk. And she took the money and he basically told her that he was going to send somebody down here to kill her. Oh, Lord, have mercy, Jesus. His own daughter, yeah. This case is just, it's just a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. You know, it's a lot to process. I'm looking through my notes, but it's just a, a whole lot. I have mm -hmm. a lot. And I'm, like, so sorry that you and your family had to go through this. I know when I first heard about this, like, I just stumbled across this case. I was on YouTube, and I just stumbled across the documentary that Oxygen Network had done. And it said the disappearance of the Millbrook twins. And the title caught my eye because, you know, I, that I do true crime on my mm -hmm. TikTok. And so I'm like, I've never heard of this case ever and I started watching a documentary and I was just blown away at like the totality of everything that has happened in this case from be beginning to end. And like you said, it seems like there was never any investigation. Like as soon as your sisters went missing, the police department decided they must be runaways. And that's yeah. what the label was. And what yeah. really scares me about that and worries me about that is the whole time that the police was developing their own theory of you know, Jeanette and Danette being runaways, they were losing valuable time because they weren't looking, they, they weren't actively looking for them. They weren't looking at any suspects. Exactly. It's like they had this theory and they were sticking to it. Yeah. You know, and... 20-something, I mean, just imagine your child leave and you don't see or uh, hear from them for 20-something years and nobody's out there looking for them. Nobody? I'm talking about nobody. Nobody but you. And you ain't, you ain't no army, you ain't no you know, a crowd of people that can go out here and just search or go door to door. People crazy now. You just can't go not say, hey, have you seen, you know, you can't do that. So she did the right thing. You know, I know those are my sisters, but she did the right thing by going to them to get them to help her. But she got shut down. And I think it was because of their skin color. I don't care what nobody say. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. And because we stayed in the project, he just said, hey, they ran away from home because he also said that he got plenty of runaways that he done had to go find them and bring them back home. And the only thing they're going to do is go run away again. Well, these girls were no runaways. You never had no indication that they ever ran away from home. No kind of paperwork, nothing that says, oh, that they ran away this day or that day. Then I see. But they never ran away from home. They right. never have did nothing to to the effect it was so many rumors going around that they ran away because my mom had too many kids then they said they ran away because one of them was pregnant it was just so many stories that we have heard now that was coming from law enforcement that people had told them supposedly but we don't know if that's true or not you know and then they told me we need the people were saying we need to get a private investigator at the time we couldn't get that my mom ain't had money for that you know she did i'm quite sure she would have but times was hard for her back then my mom was a single uh, mother she raised it was my mom had 10 kids and all 10 of us 
you know, my older sister, my baby brother that was, well, he was up on, over me. I had an older brother that was older than me. He passed away before I was born. It was the twins. And then, you know, me and then my sister Jacqueline. I got one named Tiffany, Jessica, Cicely, and my brother, his name is Jacob. And, you know, I, everybody wanted to know what happened to him. My grandma, my grandma passed away in 2006, but she always told my mom, you know, never give up, keep going out there looking. And somebody bound to listen. And I've been telling my mama that for years, like over 20 something years that I have been doing this, that I have been advocating for my sister now. Somebody bound to listen. And now look, we got national attention. They've been on TV. They've been in the newspapers now but you know it's like I feel like you know all that I'm doing I don't think it's in vain but it's just like ain't nothing happening even when they got a $50,000 reward out Crime Junkie podcast donated 39000 to the reward first it was 11000 now that it's $50,000 nobody's still saying nothing to my nobody it's just like Come well, on, I definitely want to let you know your efforts were not in vain. I don't mean to interrupt you, but they definitely weren't. I, I actually credit you. Like, I know no, I mean, it's, it's saying it's full it's line, but... <laughs> yeah, when we stuff it. like this heaven, it puts you in, in the depression mode. Like, you know, like, you, you doing it, but what are you doing it for? That, that's how I was feeling, you know what I'm saying? And then people will reach out, you know, and then that'll make me feel better. And then I start seeing all these other stories where people said their kids was missing and then go up behold, some of them don't be found alive, but at least they find them. You know what I'm saying? At least they have closure. We don't have nothing. Nothing. We don't know what happened to me. Exactly, yeah. And it's like, I know it's somebody out there that know. You know, I don't know if they're still alive. I don't know if my sister and them still alive, but it's somebody out there Somebody always talk to somebody, and I know it's got to be somebody that's out there that know. Even if it's something small, you know what I'm saying, it could lead to something big. That's all I want people to know that we that we did look. We looked for my sister now. It wasn't our fault. If they still out there, we want them to know that we love them. We want them to come home. We didn't stop looking for them. We just didn't have the help and the resources for people to too know that they was missing because if it hadn't been for the fall down podcast i'm quite sure we still would be in the say i know and I, I applaud richmond county you know the sheriff i for opening the case back up but it's like they, they open it back up and we still ain't getting nowhere i don't know what they're doing now you know what i'm saying they might be working on it and we just don't know but like i mean i don't know you know I don't want to make them mad, you know, and if they is out there doing something to help or whatever, I don't want to make them mad because I think for a long time after that documentary aired, they didn't want nothing to do with us, period. They want to talk to the media, nobody about my sister them at all. And when you say that, you're talking about law enforcement. Yeah, Richmond County Sheriff's Department, they didn't want to have no dealings with us. They didn't want to talk to nobody if they called down there to talk to them about the, my sister them case. They told them, you know, they didn't want to have no involvement in it. But my so, thing is, you know, they, they need to not take that personal. And I know it's hard, but it's like they need to be. I mean, they that. shouldn't. You know, this is they your should, this but is your I think they got it bad. Yeah, I think they was embarrassed oh. after the documentary aired. Mm -hmm. I think they got embarrassed because of how they treated the case from the get go. Even though some of them probably went in law enforcement at the time when my sister and them went missing, but I'm quite sure they knew about it because for a long time I was calling down there over 20 years. I know for a fact I was calling down there trying to get somebody, and they knew who I was before, but they didn't know who I was. I was specifically, they know my name was Shante Sturgis, but they knew I was one of the Mirabrook twin sisters before so I can say their names. They be like, oh, you talking about the Mirabrook twin. So somebody knew something. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, what, what are y'all doing? I know, I understand they have so much crime out here that's been going on. You know, but it's like <laughs> they could have put one specific person on this case and stuck to that one specific person 
But my sister there probably had over, I don't know how many investigators over their cases, the case went back open. Wow. Yeah, I remember you saw so, I mean, I don't know what. I don't know what to do no more. You know what I'm saying? I'm just going to continue to do what I've been doing. And that's advocating for them, making sure their names stay alive, you know. Because maybe one day, you know, before my mom leaves this world, she'll be able to find out what happened to her daughters. Well, I stand with you. I definitely support you. Anything I can do, anything that y'all need from me, you know. And I, I, I agree to keep pushing, keep making sure yeah. their name is out there because you just might jog somebody's memory and like you said it can that's be what the I'm thing. Yeah. that's why i keep going i keep doing it because i know it's got to be somebody somebody out there knows something even if it's something small even if they don't want to talk to law enforcement they got this it's an anonymous number on the billboard that they have up that people could call and they can remain anonymous they can call richmond county and remain anonymous say something you know because if like they family member, I know for a fact I will get involved. The um your sister's billboard is up in Augusta, Georgia. When was it put up? I was I meant to ask you that earlier. The first one was put up, I wanna say maybe twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen, somewhere up in there. I wanna say it was twenty eighteen. The first one was put up. But the other two they just got put up uh this year. No, last year, 2022. Okay. Yep, they put them up and they changed the amount because the, the reward was extra $8,000 at first. And then a lot of people start hearing about my sister and story. And the fall line, they have a um, GoFundMe account that they made to get people to donate money to it to keep my sister and billboard up. So people was donating and donating and they was able to get that billboard put up. And then they got another one put up, but um, Crime Junkie and the Lamar building, I want to say, they was another one. They helped out, too, and that's why they got these three billboards up now. So you got one that's on Middlesbrough Road, you have one that's on Gordon Highway and Sibley Road, and you have another one that's on Washington Road that I haven't seen, but somebody inboxed me and told me that it was another one up, but I haven't seen that one. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you if you're up to taking questions from the audience, from the people that's on the live. Can you see the comments on your side, on your end? Um, yes. So okay. nowadays if they were lost, they would have been found. So if y'all have questions, keep your questions respectful or I will have my moderator block you and remove you from this live. But if you you all have questions for Shantae, you can definitely ask her in the chat you can type it in the chat i think i saw a question earlier the comments was coming in so fast somebody said whoever knows something i'm sure it's hunting them to this day how often um are you all in touch with the detective who's assigned to the case now since the case has been reopened for a while now we ain't in contact with nobody they ain't got nobody over that wow. we know don't nobody, so call, like I said, don't nobody call us. It's like it's open. <laughs> but we don't know what's going on because they don't contact us. We have to reach out to them. It's still going on just like it was in 1990. We still got to reach out to them. Wow. Do you know if there's any lead that's happening on the case? I, it's just crazy to me. I, I, I don't understand. But, yeah. So do you huh? think there's any um, detective on the case currently since it's been reopened or y'all y'all just don't? Y'all don't know. We have no idea. No, we don't, we don't know. You would think I know we have a private investigator. Yeah, we have a private investigator over it now. He's doing what he can, but this you got to think. Yesterday was thirty three years that my sister knew been missing, and this man only had the case maybe a year and a half now, and he he working on it. You know, he's trying to do what he can, but. You know, we just got to give it time. But he said that he wasn't going to never give up. He wasn't going to stop until he get answers. So, you know, I have faith in God, and I believe that he will one day. It might take five years from now. might take a couple of months, but I think he will. No, the FBI is not involved. They wouldn't get involved because they said the police department had to get them involved. 
So you ask the question. Do you see the other one under her? Somebody mm -hmm. named Queen B. Queen B, I would like to ask what she believes may have happened to her sisters. I think that the, um, whatever happened to them happened the day they went missing. I don't know what, but somebody had to do something. Because nobody ain't seen them. Some people tell me, well, what if, you know, how that case was like in Cleveland, Ohio with those girls where that Andrew Castro dude had kidnapped those girls and they was like right down the street from their parents' house and they had no idea. People was saying like maybe that happened, but where? Where would you go look? You know what I'm saying? Then they saying that people um, checked the brickyard pond where Ernest said that my sister and them body was probably was. Nobody says they ever checked it because law enforcement said that they have a ha have to have a specific spot to look because the place was too big just to have a search party go out there. So some people down here in my city did go out there and did their own search party. They found old clothes, old shoes, but it wasn't nothing that my sister and them had. You know what I'm saying? That we seen um, them last seen in. You know, um, Jeanette was last seen with a, um, a all over um, turtleneck, white uh, beige skirt. She had some um, black shoes and she had some white stockings on because we just had came from church. And then it changed her clothes. She had a white um, Mickey Mouse shirt on with some white pants and some white tennis shoes. And, yeah, Somebody I remember the date. Divine Bree, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, but she asked, how was your last interaction with them? With My the last interaction with them was, I asked to go with them that day. I was laying on my mama's sofa. <laughs> I was looking at TV and I heard her tell them to go in and her back and I asked them could I go and they was like no nah. I was like I want to go because I already knew they was going to my goddaddy house I was trying to go get some change to go get candy and stuff to take to school with me but yeah uh, they told me no I couldn't go they said girl we'll be back and I was like I don't care if y'all come back or not I still want to go and they was like girl we'll be back and that was the last they, they said to me that they, they was coming home. They'd be back home. And they never came back. Somebody said, I wondered about they this question. Somebody years said, years. you see this one, Sandra? Sandra, okay. Have you ever thought about talking to the scientist? Um, I mean, some have reached out to me, but it's like... <laughs> I don't need them to tell me nothing that I already talked about. I need them to tell me something else, something that they know for a fact that we can go out here and look because most of the things that people done already talked to me about is something that I already done said or I already done heard people say, you know. So, mm -mm. She said, yeah, this could be related to you. Do you think the Godfather had something to do with them missing? No. No. I don't think that either. No, because the police did go talk to him. They did go to his house. Now, after all the investigation, they went to his house. They uh, talked to the kids at the school, some of the friends. Now, some of the friends um, that we see to this day that they had had said that the same investigator that said they talked to them back then are saying now that they never talked to him. So, who lying? You know what I'm saying? Is it them or is it an investigator? But I don't think it would be them because they got kids now too. So why would you want to keep lying like that? You know what I'm saying? Saying if you know something, you ain't going to say nothing. You just going to keep going on with the story that, oh yeah, we seen them here, we seen them there. But knowing that they haven't, he's the only one that's still sticking to his story that they had been found and that they just the unruly runaways. Wow. Yeah, and it seems like the police will have more of a reason to lie anyway than anybody else at this point. Yeah. Somebody said, "What was the age when they went missing?" They were fifteen, I believe. Yeah, they was fifteen. They went missing two weeks before their sixteenth birthday. Wow. 
and their birthday is coming up April the second. They will be forty nine years old. I said, like, what another another two weeks? Yeah. Um, are you all going to be doing anything for their birthday? We actually just um did something at a gala Saturday, not this Saturday. But last Saturday, and it wasn't just for my sister and them, but it was for other missing people in our area. And, um, you know, a lot of people be asking me that, but the only reason why I don't try to, like, do nothing because I don't think people show up. Because the people that came, we did have one, um, like, after 2017. I want to say it was, like, 20. 19 that we had um one at the store where they went missing we had a um visual for them and nobody in my hometown showed up but um like two of my friends and the rest of the people was from all over the world you know different cities but nobody from here from augusta georgia nobody well i know it's a lot of people all here. Here. So, you know I want to thank the people that did show up, you know what I'm saying? But, and, you know, for their time and effort that they took to come out there to help us advocate for them, you know, but I don't know. And then I be, I, I, I've been depressed for a long time, you know what I'm saying? So I try to, I don't know if I, it, it, I be thinking in my mind that if I do something like that for them, that ain't nobody gonna show up, and then it'll make me more depressed again because I still be thinking again that don't nobody care, you know. But people only care when it happens to them. Me, I care if it happened to your family, they family, you know, whoever family. I still care because I know how this feel every day going without my sister them not knowing what happened to them. And I know that's hard. I know that has to be hard. I'm a mom, so I get in. I, my oldest yeah. daughter is about to be 14 in April. So she's like mm -hmm. right around the age that your sisters were. So I could not even imagine. Exactly. And that's what I, and that's why I be trying to get my kids to understand. Like my daughter yesterday, she was 13. She wanted me to drop her off in the neighborhood that I feel is dangerous. I feel it's dangerous because... I knew growing up in that area where she want me to take her to, you know, it's always stuff happening. And she telling me ain't nothing going to happen to me, mom. It's the same thing my older sister told my mom one day. This happened before the twins went missing. She told my mom wasn't nothing going to happen to her. My mom told her we had just moved from one house to the, the next house. And my mom wanted to um, check the mail at the old house. She told my older sister, don't worry about going out there. We'll go tomorrow. She went out there anyway, and she was raped. Somebody hit her in the head with a stick and raped her and told her that he could kill her right then and there when nobody never know who did it. And this was like, I want to say maybe six, seven months before my sister and them even went missing. Yeah. Did they ever catch who this person was? They never. No. This ain't the only encounter she done had. <laughs> you know, my older sister, This that was like the first one. She done had another one before she left the house. And the store where my sister then went missing from, my older sister was dragged in that alley behind that store and raped by, she said it was like four people, but I'm not sure how many it was, because like I said, I was still young back then, but I remember all that happened. And just for clarity, y'all, she's not talking about the twins. She's talking about her, her other sister. Yeah, my older sister. She passed away on their birthday, wow. April the 2nd, 2018. Wow. Yeah. I remember getting ready to, you know, try to have a little um, get-together for my mom because it was the twins' birthday. And I say about nine o'clock that morning, we had got a phone call saying that we need to come to the hospital. I get my mom down to the hospital, we get there, and instead of the doctors, we think we're going to see her. You know, we knew she had been rushed to the hospital. We think we're going there to see her, or whatever. 
I told my mom something, don't feel right, Ma. I said, it's something just strange that we in this little room. Why is we in this room? And I was on the phone with my oldest daughter. And I was like, you know, let me call you back because my phone was getting ready to die. And I had to put it on the charger. And as soon as I got ready to get up to put it on the charger, the doctor came in and told, asked us, was asking us questions about what happened, you know, what was going on with my sister. We was coming there to get questions, you know, to ask them questions. And lo and behold, they just told us that she had passed away at 930. And remind you, I had asked them, could I come down there? Because I was already taking my uh, youngest, one of my youngest daughters to the doctor that day. And they told me I couldn't uh, come. They told me to wait it out because they was trying to stabilize her. But she was already had them passed away at 930 that morning. Wow. And that was on their birthday. Yeah. And I told my mom it was just strange after that. All this time, I have never had a dream about my sister now. And for some reason that year that my sister passed away, I had a dream that my sister now, that I had found them. That I found the twins and my older sister um, passed on their birthday. But after that, before, I had a dream before she passed away and I don't know in the dream they was doing something with their hands after I had found them because I was like oh my god I can't believe I found y'all the whole time they was in a basement in somebody's house in a basement but the basement um you had to pull it up uh the ladder up from the floor from the top um from the bottom of the floor and pull it up and they would have to climb out from like uh, they was climbing out from underground or whatever and when they got out of there and I was crying in the dream and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I found y'all. And I was trying to get on the phone to call my mom. I said, let me call my mom. And the whole time they were standing in front of each other doing something with their hands. And I was telling my mama about the dream. And my mama was like, well, maybe this is a sign. Maybe they're trying to show you something. You know what I'm saying? But what? I don't know. And then Lord behold, my older sister passed away on their birthday. And I thought about that was another sign, you know, even though we had to grieve for her passing away on their birthday, I still thought in my mind, maybe that's a sign. Maybe that's a sign that we going to find it. I mean, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Maybe it's a sign that they might be in heaven with God. We, we, we don't know. We just don't know nothing. You know what I'm saying? But I'm still hopeful that they are alive somewhere. And you know sometimes dreams can be premonitions. So maybe they are yeah. in, in a basement somewhere. Maybe God was showing you a sign, you know, giving you a vision. Yeah. I believe in, in that kind of stuff. I'm a very spiritual yeah. person. I mean, I had said that too, but we don't know. We don't know where to look. We just don't know. And then what if the whole time, them 20 something years, that they was alive and nobody looked for them? What have these people been telling them that nobody cared nothing about them? You know, uh, brainwash them and say, oh, your family don't care because 20-something years done went by. They ain't seen their faces on the posters. They ain't seen their faces on the news. You know, nothing is going on pertaining to Jenny and then at Millbrook. So they probably was thinking in it because they, they want to know little bit of kids to where they can remember their names. They knew their names, you know what I'm saying? So if their name was being run through the news media or somebody would have been saying something about it then you know we could have been probably not where we at today we probably would know what happened to them but by their names not being heard of nobody heard of a uh, Jeanette and a Danette Mirabrook being missing but a select few people that was in our city half our city in Augusta didn't even know they was missing wow and you know that's crazy your whole hometown don't know that it's two girls that been missing out here for 20 something years People didn't really start knowing until 2013, and then still yet, a lot of people didn't know until the documentary aired. That's how you know the world don't pay attention to what they're supposed to pay attention to. They pay attention to the wrong thing, but the stuff they're supposed to pay attention to, they don't. And these girls could have been right there in their eyesight. Not saying that they could have did something about it, but they could have let somebody know. Exactly. Pick up the phone. Call yeah, somebody. Exactly. Because I never had to be me. And I had to see somebody, and they've been missing for that long. And the family been looking for them. I would have reached out. I would have said something. Even if it was anonymous, even if I was scared for my life, I would have had to say something because 
you just don't sit there on something knowing that this could happen to you too. It could be you one day. Your child could get up in the morning. You thinking they finna go to school or they finna go walk across the street to the store or whatever the case may be. And you don't see them no more. And then you got the law person telling you, oh, you got to wait 24 hours. They passed that law after my sister and them went missing that it was no longer you had to wait 24 hours. You go ahead and report them missing right then and there. And then they came up with the Amber Alert, but uh -huh. they came up with that years later, you know. Uh -huh. But still, yet, you know, it was something that could have been done in 1990. It was no cameras around at the gas station, were no cameras inside the gas station, were no social media back then. You know, I understand all that, but it was still something that they could have did back then instead of not doing nothing at all, not doing a real investigation. Exactly. Because like you said, had the had law enforcement investigated like they were supposed to from a jump, we may know we may have known years ago what happened, or they could have been found. Yes, even if, right. Even if it wasn't what we would have wanted to hear, we still wanna know, you know what I'm saying? Even if they are deceased, we still wanna know where. Let my mama give her daughters a proper barrier. You get what I'm saying? If that's the case, if Detective Shift did find them and they said they didn't want to come back home, let her talk to them. You know, let them twins go to their mama and be like, Mama, well, we didn't want to come back home. My da da da. You claim 17 years old was the legal age for them not to come back home. That means you were saying they was grown already. So if you felt that they was grown, you knew where they were at. Why didn't you tell them, you know, tell my mom, okay, well, they at this such and such address. I seen them here. You can go down there and verify what they told me that they didn't want to come back home. You just flat out said that if you did find them, that you can make them come back home because they were 17 years old. But you didn't say, well, you said, first you said they was found. Then you said that because they were 17. I mean, which, you know, which is it? Exactly. Somebody needs to look. He really needs to be looked at with a mic. I, I, I told the, the, the new sheriff, the sheriff that we have now. Yeah. They need to I really told look at him. him. I'm sorry I to say this, and I, I don't even really want to say this publicly, but I'm just going to say it. He's on my suspect list because... Yep. I see. I've been telling people the same thing. Just think about it, man. You are the only one. You the investigator. You was the one that's supposed to be going around looking for them. Okay. You said that they was located. Can you come closer to the mic so we can hear you closer to the phone? I'm sorry. Okay. I said he was the one that said that they had been found. He was the one that said that they was located. So. Why would you wait to uh, 1993 to go in the system, call up that to the National Mission is North Trader, tell them to take them out of the database, say they wasn't supposed to be in that database anyway because they were going to run the runaways, okay? Then push forward, you still saying all this to this day, even if you look at the documentary, you're hear him, you won't see him, but you're going to hear them talking to him on the phone, mm -hmm. and he basically saying something wrong with my mom, like my mom don't have the right mind frame. My mom mind is good. She's probably got older, but she still remember that man not coming to her house, talking to her until he came there and told her he was a guard. I didn't look for her daughters anymore and he was close to the case. He said my mom and I can never was a zero or some kind of mess in the documentary, but he didn't do his job and now you won't hear about it today. My sister and them was these kind of um, wrote the girls that just was out there getting into all types of trouble and stuff, and that's why these people want to help us. Just anything. They want to fight the girls. I'm, I'm like, seriously, like, I know people always say, well, you don't know what your kids are doing, da da da. I'm their sister. We used to sleep in the same bed together. We used to sleep in the same room together. We used to get up and go to school. They went to uh, um, middle school. They was in uh, high school. When I was still in elementary, but um, 
can I, can y'all hear her? Because I'm having trouble on my end. Like it's like I can hear you, but it's it's not like how it was before. Like it's really lower, and it's just it's kind of staticky sounding. Okay, hold up. And I just want to make sure they can hear you clearly. Somebody in the comments said, "Not really. It sounds like robot, ro robotic to me." Yeah, it's the, it's a little bit staticky. She might have to um, call back in. So you can watch um, the documentary on Oxygen Network. You can also pull it up, pull up the Oxygen Network documentary on YouTube. It's called um, "The Disappearance of the Millbrook Twins." That's the name of the documentary that. Oxygen Network did and they actually Featured the family The sister that I just talked to Shantae she was featured in the Documentary the twins Mother was featured in the documentary um, I believe some of the original Investigators were in The documentary so yeah You can go and pull that up on YouTube um, It is called the disappearance Of the Millbrook twins Shantae If you're on here just try to call Oh, mate, let me see. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, you sound you sound clear now, honey. You sound okay. perfect. Now. <laughs> I don't know what was going on with Beyonce's internet a minute ago, but we got together. Okay. I was just going through some of the questions, but if people want to like connect with you, can you um, drop your social media tags if you feel comfortable? Um, that's fine. Um. My um, Facebook page name I got for them is the um, Millbrook Twins, um, the Disappearing Millbrook Twins, and then I have um, my page is Shante Keep It Moving Sturgis, and then I have the one on TikTok is Shante Sturgis One. I got to send you a, a request on um, TikTok, a follow request, but I don't want to mm -hmm. hold you too long. I know it's Sunday, so I'm getting ready to. This is my cleaning day. So, you know, I make my kids clean every Sunday. We're going to clean the whole house, spring cleaning. And I just, you know, you and your family are definitely in my prayers. And I don't want you to feel for one second like your, your work and your fight was in vain because it definitely was not. I feel like you are your sister's biggest advocate. You always have been, you know, and I, I know that's, that's a heavy cross to bear. But I feel yeah. like had it not been for your initial efforts, the fall line and all these other people probably never would have known who the Melbourne twins were. So I feel right. like you need to give yourself a lot more credit, a lot more credit. I really yeah, I just wish we could have did. I, I wish it was social media out back then. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know, yeah. I know. But we we got the word out there, and I know it's you know, I know it's late in the game. But I'm just I'm just so proud of you. And you know, I'm, I'm an advocate anyway offline like away from this tiktok stuff i advocate for homeless families in my city so like i know what it's like to you know to advocate and to push and to feel like you, you're pushing against government entities that just aren't listening just don't want to hear you and even when you were faced with that you kept going so i see like that fighting mm -hmm. spirit in you that same spirit that i have i see that in you when it comes to them and i'm, I'm so glad that they have you i really am i'm so glad your sisters have you fighting and advocating for them that's a blessing Yep, thank you. Yep, I'm going to keep going. I just want everybody to know, you know, that they're still out there. It's 33 years. If they know something, say something. They ain't got to tell their name, you know. Just say something, because if it was if they family members, I'm quite sure they would want somebody to help them, too. And if they have information, they can contact the tip line, the Augusta tip line in Augusta, Georgia. They can Google that. Yes, I don't know exactly the um the phone number. To they can it, Google it. Yeah, it's on the um it's they have it on their billboard. I got their billboard um posted up on their um page that I have for them. I have that or they can call um, you know, the Fall Line podcast. They also have um a lot of information, you know, that they can call them and contact them about they can call crime junkie um they can even call richmond county sheriff's office if they know anything okay okay well i appreciate you thank you for talking to me i will definitely be in touch if that's okay this definitely won't be the last time um that we speak and you and your family are definitely in my prayers but i just want to let you know as a as somebody that's an advocate, your voice has inspired me. So don't ever feel like your your fight was in vain because it's not. It's not. Trust me, it's not. Okay. 
Okay. Well, we gonna talk right, about thank y'all for listening. You know, y'all can share and keep their name in y'all prayers and just pray that this right here be the last year because the fifty thousand dollar reward they have up for them now in August it won't be a fifty thousand reward. It's going back down to eleven thousand dollars, but the the money is going to be put to good use. They supposed to use it for you know like to help with other missing um cases and stuff like that. But um yeah. So right now it's fifty thousand. August will be it'll go back down to eleven thousand dollars if nobody ever come forward with any information leading to their whereabouts. Well I'm praying I'm praying y'all can get justice and y'all can get the closure that y'all deserve. Yeah. You know, I really am. Thank y'all so much for listening. Thank you for coming on. Yeah. We'll talk soon. Okay. Okay, y'all.